welcome to Etz Chaim, which means the Tree of Life. We're a messianic congregation that understands that Jesus is Yeshua, our Messiah, and He wants us to follow the Torah just as He did. Come check us out. You're invited to join us for our Saturday service at 1 p.m. You can also gain valuable insights at our 4 p.m. Bible study. Your questions are welcome. And now, with a weekly Torah reading, Rabbi Mordecai Silver. Today's portion is Va'ira, and it means, and I appeared. It's Exodus 6, 2 through 9, 35. The Haftorah portion is Ezekiel 28, 25 through 29, 21. And the Apostolic Scripture portion is Matthew 26, 63 through 66. The introduction, the title of this parasha, and God's second appearance to Moses, comes from the verse, I appeared, Va'ira, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. A dramatic emergence that contains a stunning omission, I have remembered my covenant. I don't really think that God forgot his covenant. Okay, I believe it's just for the people to tell them that I have remembered my covenant because it's now time for the next phase in the history of the children of Israel as God's beginning to move them, to form them into a nation. In Exodus 7, 1 through 3, Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I make you as God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. You shall speak all that I command you. And your brother Aaron shall speak to Pharaoh, that he let the sons of Israel go out of his land. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart, that I may multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. The Lord would make Moses as a god to Pharaoh. Do you realize the immensity of what it's saying there? That Moses would become like God to Pharaoh? I mean, God is putting a lot of stock and a lot of trust in Moses that he's going to be doing, you know, to do his will. And that Aaron would speak to Pharaoh as his prophet. So he's giving Moses a prophet to speak for him. I want a prophet. And we're going to get to some scripture that's going to talk about that anyway, because that's the way it seems today, doesn't it? When you look out there, when you look on, if you want, you know, look at different things on TV, or you, you hear different things that are going on around this, you hear people that say, I'm a prophet, I'm this, I'm that, I'm, you know, I hear people that say, well, I'm a Torah teacher, but you don't have to follow the Torah. <laughs> well, what kind of a teacher of a Torah are you if you don't teach the Torah? You're teaching your own version of the Torah which is not God's version of the Torah, because God's version of the Torah is, you will do it. I wish there was a Moses today that was here. There will be two witnesses that God's going to bring. and there's there, Some people say it's not going to be two witnesses. Some people say it's going to be the two houses of Israel. I don't accept that because I can't interpret it that way from what Scripture says. It's talking about two witnesses that God will raise up to in the last days who will be speaking God's word to the people whether they want to hear it or not. And he will protect them for a period of time and in the end he will allow them to be killed. You know, the word of God is not meant to soothe us at all times. It's meant to make us to sit up and take notice. It's meant to take, make us take stock of ourselves. And we need to take stock of ourselves before we start taking stock of other people. We have to take stock of ourselves and then we reach out to other people to be a witness to them to share God's word with them. We want to protect them. We want to bring them something that we see, that we feel, that we embrace in our walk with Messiah. In our walk with Messiah, we want to be witnesses and examples for him. Because that's what we're called to. We want to try to get other people to be interested in what we've chosen to put upon ourselves as a lifestyle. And it is a lifestyle. It's not something that you put on on Saturday and then you take off the other 
six days of the week. It's a lifestyle that means lifestyle. You live it every single day. So every single day you have to take stock of yourself in your relationship with the Lord. Are you right with Him? Are you right with Messiah? Is your faith centered in the Messiah so that you can come into the presence of the Father? Some Jews teach that you can go right to God, you don't need a Messiah. The problem is, is that Yeshua said you need to go through Him in order to get to the Father. You need to come to Him. And He's been empowered by the Father to forgive our sins. The only one in Scripture, from everything that I've ever studied in there, who could forgive sin was God. So if Yeshua is not the Son of God and empowered by God as His Son, which meaning He also is God, then how can our sins be forgiven? In 1 Timothy 4, 7 and 8 it says, But reject profane and old wives' fables, and exercise yourselves toward godliness. For bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things having promise of the life that is now is and of that which is to come. But reject profane and old wives' fables and exercise yourself toward godliness. So that means every single day you get up and you do those 20 push-ups for Abba. You get down there and you go, one Abba, two Abba, three Abba. And then you get out there and you start walking and you get out there and you go, one Abba, two Abba, three, and you keep going until it's faster and faster and faster and you get that. And you do it for the Lord. For bodily exercise profits a little. It doesn't mean you shouldn't exercise. Okay? Now it's not saying that, but some people might take it that way. But godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. You need to focus on the things of God every single day. you got to focus on God. you got to focus on the ways of God. And what are the things of God? What are in the Torah? What the Messiah taught us. What the Messiah continues to teach us. In 2 Timothy 2.19 it says, Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, having this seal, the Lord knows those who are His, And let everyone who names the name of Messiah depart from iniquity. If Yeshua's name is on your lips, you should be turning away and running away from sin. You need to depart from iniquity. The Lord knows who are His. Not everybody belongs to Him. It all comes down to free will because He gives us free will. He knows, he knows who will be his, but the end result is, is that he's not telling us it's up to us to have to make the choice and walk that walk. If you don't walk that walk and if you don't stay the course, you're not his. And Titus 2.11 through 15, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Yeshua the Messiah, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. There are people who are going to despise you, who aren't going to like the message that you have to bring. You can't let it deter you from the job and the responsibility that the Lord has given to us. You, if you're to be witnesses of the Messiah, you need to stand up and be counted. No matter how it's received. You have to face the reality that the closer we get to the last days, the less people are going to be happy about hearing what you have to say about God. They're not going to want... The only God they're going to want to hear about is the God that tells them that what they do is okay. They want the pat on the back. They want to be told that, yes, 
My God's the same as your God, but I can go out there and I can have, I can live in a homosexual relationship. That's not my God. That's not my God who says that. We need to realize that we need to be on a foundation of Messiah. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Now we could say, okay, the present age, he's talking about Paul is the writer of the book of Titus. So he's talking about when he wrote that 2,000 years ago. No, I believe it doesn't matter. It's whatever age you're in. That's the application. That's the beauty of Scripture because Scripture applies across the board. Scripture applied in the beginning. Scripture applies now. And Scripture will apply in the future. That's the beauty of the Word of God. It never goes out of style. In Matthew seven twenty one through 23, it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons. And in your name perform many miracles. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice Torahlessness. That last part, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness or Torahlessness, is a direct quote from Psalm 6, 8. And in Psalm 6, 8 it says, Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity, for the Lord has heard the voice of my weeping. It's a direct quote from there. Yeshua is quoting this scripture. And you notice what he says. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons. And in your name perform many miracles. Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Who do you think he's talking about there? Those who don't know him are not doing these things. These are, he's talking about people who say they are believers and are followers of him. And he's saying, you are not a follower of me. Because you did not do the things that I had instructed you to do. I mean, a lot of people would turn around and go, well, only Pentecostals and Charismatics prophesy. Only Pentecostals and Charismatic cast out demons. Well, Catholics cast out demons too, you know, in exorcism. And in your name perform many miracles. A lot of people do pray for people and see healings and different things happen through that. Is it God that's doing it? Or is it Satan that's doing it? I believe it all depends on the spirit that you're doing it and who you're doing it for. You, should not, you shouldn't be doing You know, what I notice in this scripture, it says, and in your name we cast out demons, and in your name we perform miracles, and in your name we prophesy. They're saying they do it in his name, but are they doing it in his name? I think that's what we need to understand. You know, I've been spending over the last year reading through the scriptures and coming through these things, and I always keep coming back to these scriptures. And why do I keep coming back to them? Because it weighs on me that I have to be careful about what I teach because I don't want to be responsible for misleading anybody. I try not to because I always tell you, test my teachings against scripture. And always, always, Keep your eyes on Yeshua. Amen. Never take them off. As you begin to explore who you are because you're trying to find out the truth, never take your eyes off Yeshua. Everything that you do has to be done according to Messiah. You have to test it against Him. Ezekiel 28, 25 to 26. Thus says the Lord God, when I gather the house of Israel from the peoples among whom they are scattered and will manifest my holiness in them in the sight of the nations, then they will live in their land 
which I gave to my servant Jacob. They will live in it securely, and they will build houses, plant vineyards, and live securely when I execute judgments upon all who scorn them round about them. Then they will know that I am the Lord their God. He is regathering Israel. He's regathering the children of Israel. He's bringing them back. He's calling them home from the four corners of the earth, from the nations of the earth. Not all of us have been called yet in order to return to the land. But we have a place and a job to do wherever we live. And it doesn't matter whether you were born Jewish or not to be a part of Israel. To be a part of Israel, it takes two things. It takes believing in Yeshua and keeping Torah. Those are the two requirements to be part of that. To be grafted into the tree that is Israel, that's required. Because there are some who have been grafted into the tree of Israel who spurn Israel because of their unbelief and he says, I will cut you out. So faith in Yeshua or belief in Yeshua doesn't keep you in that tree if you look down your nose at the Jewish people because of their blindness. Because he says about them, in their unbelief I cut them off out of the tree, but in their belief I graft them back in again. So he can graft them back in because of their belief. You should be afraid that you can be cut out of that tree even in your belief. Genesis 2, 20 to 24. And the man gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the sky and to all the wild beasts. But for Adam, no fitting helper was found. So the Lord God cast a deep sleep upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that spot. And the Lord God fashioned the rib that he had taken from the man into a woman. And he brought her to the man. Then the man said, This one at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman. For from man was she taken. Hence a man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife so that they become one flesh. A man and a woman were meant to be together. The Lord says that in Scripture. It was for that point. You notice he says, this one shall be called woman. Woman in Hebrew is chava. That's what it means, chava. Yeah, there is another word that you could use. Isha is used, but it's not used, our chava. And chava is the comparison of the mother of all living, which is what Eve is from the Greek that they usually translate for that. But chava is the proper Hebrew word that's used to denote the woman. The man is known as Adam, for he was taken from the earth. Dam means blood. Dam is earth. Genesis 20, or 220 to 24. This is another take on this. The man gave names to all cattle, and to the birds of the air, and to every animal of the field. But for the man there was not found a helper as his partner. So the Lord God calls, and it goes on, and it's basically saying the same thing. But you notice it says, not found a helper as his partner. A helpmate is not somebody who is in a lower status to that individual. A helpmate is an equal partner in the relationship. Because they're the same part. Because woman was made from man. And then the Lord commands that they come together as one. So the two parts need to come together and to form the whole. So you need the whole. So they're equal partners in that. So men should not look down on women. Because if they do, the women are going to give them a swift kick in the you know what. And... We know that it was a rib that he took from this side, and some people would say it was not, because the Hebrew word that's used there for uh, rib, it's tzelah. Tzelah means the side, 
a rib, a beam, a rib of man, a rib of a hill or ridge, side chambers or cells of a temple structure, plank, board, and leaves of a door inside of the ark. It's kind of interesting when you read. So the same word is used for the rib of a man as the same word that can be used as the side of the ark. Interesting. When you look at all these things. In order for man to function properly, he needs a helpmate. He needs a partner. He needs someone that will be there with him. Matthew 26, 63 through 66. But Yeshua kept silent, and the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God that you tell us whether you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Yeshua said to him, You have said it yourself. Nevertheless, I tell you, Hereafter, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power, coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, He has blasphemed. What further need do we have of witnesses? Behold, you have now heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They answered, He deserves death. Yeshua's crime was one of blasphemy. What did the temple priests, what did the leaders of the people claim before the Romans to be the crime of Yeshua? That he claimed to be the king of the Jews. They couldn't go before Pilate and say that Yeshua's crime was one that he claimed to be God. Why couldn't they do that? Because the Romans had many gods. So somebody claiming that they were God wouldn't matter to them. But it was another story if they said he claimed to be king and had not been appointed by Rome. Because Rome appointed the kings of Israel in that day. So his crime was that. And you notice how he answered him. He didn't come out and he said that I am the Messiah. He said, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. That is a quote from Psalm 110.1 and Daniel 7.13. You will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power. Psalm 110.1. And coming on the clouds of heaven. Daniel 7.13. Now that part and that quote and coming on the clouds of heaven. Some people would say well that's talking about the rapture. No, it's talking about the second coming of the Messiah because we're told in Scripture that as he went and as he w- returned to his father in his ascension, that's how he would come back. And they said they saw him rise into the clouds. So he's going to come that way, coming on the clouds of heaven. It's no UFO that's coming, people. It's Y E S H U A. 1 Peter 5.8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. You need to be ready, people. Satan is there at your doorstep. He's waiting. You make a slip up, he's going to be in there. He's going to be in there planning doubt. He already does that to us. No matter how long we've been in the faith, no matter how strong we believe it is, Satan still is there tempting us. Fact is, I think the longer you're in the faith, the more you're going to get tempted. And that happens today. People become confused because of where they go. They seek out teachers who tickle their ears. They need to seek out teachers who will challenge them. In Psalm 30, 11 and 12, You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness. To the end that my glory may sing praise to you and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give thanks to you forever. The Psalms glorify God in such a mighty way that it brings comfort to you. And I think that praying scripture is power. And it doesn't have to be limited just to the Psalms. You can pray what the Messiah taught. 
So you're praying the Psalms in some cases and you're praying Torah in that case. How can you be any more powerful in your prayer life than that? Shalom to our television audience. Come and enjoy yourself through our website. You can find all kinds of materials, all kinds of videos, all kinds of audio teachings, all kinds of written teachings. Then join us on our discussion site, our forum, Torah Talk. Shalom, everyone.